in wild, you need to keep an eye, you need to monitor, but you can't be disrupting their life. I think the name of the cheetah was Pawan. He was the first cheetah released from Namibia. <coughs> After some time, he went out, he was brought back, he was released, he went out again. They went and captured him again. Now, is this a way to even treat a wild animal? So why are the cheetahs still in captivity? That's the question I keep coming back to. You brought them to release them in the wild. You brought them to save your grasslands, your great Indian bustard or whatever. Why you keep capturing and bringing them back into captivity? How are they going to do their job? To me, this is more a management to try and show you're managing rather than allow ecology and conservation science to inform your management. I would like to see myself more coming, fighting for the lion. And cheetah happens to be one of the obstacles to the lion translocation. You have to remember that the Supreme Court on 15th of April 2013 explicitly ordered the translocation of lions. I can't find a more diplomatic way of saying it. I would say it's impunity that certain people believe they are above the law. The official reason, on paper, Gujarat keeps saying IUCN guidelines have not been followed. So lions cannot be translocated. Have the IUCN guidelines been followed for the cheetahs? If Kuno is good enough for African cheetahs, they are definitely good enough for our own neighboring lions to come from. The Reasons given for cheetahs, I told you, African cheetah population is surplusing. They don't have space for cheetahs. But that's not true. And even if that was true, is it India's responsibility to conserve African cheetahs? And I don't think we are suggesting get cheetahs from Iran today. We are suggesting invest in Iran today. Build the conservation capacity. Help the Asiatic cheetah survive. Bringing cheetahs from Africa to India is not conservation. Let's make that very, very clear. Thank you, Shikha. Can you hear me? Or do I need to do anything? It's okay. Maybe I'm not switched it on. Yeah. yeah it works better now. Good. Uh, I'm going to quickly run through a bunch of slides, essentially to set the context. Uh, and then uh, I am going to be interrogated by Devavati sitting to my right. So you have the topic. There's nothing much to say. And this is the animal we're going to be talking about. Uh, African cheetahs. And this is the conservation status of the African cheetahs. All the red that you see is former range. The animal is extinct from these sites. And only the kind of ochre color, brown color patches are where uh, the animals are found now. And the estimate is about 7,000 cheetahs on the whole, of which about 6,500 are mature individuals. And they exist in severely fragmented and decreasing population. It is restricted now to only 9% of its former range, but even that 9% adds up to more than 3 million square kilometers. Please note these numbers because the, those are relevant to our discussion today. The density at which they exist ranges quite widely from as low as 0.25 2.5 per 100 square kilometers. That is, in 100 kil uh, square kilometers, you can have as low as 0 0.25 cheetahs, which means to have a cheetah, you want to need 4,000 square kilometers, or it can be as high as 2.5 cheetahs per 100 square kilometers. And the best densities are found in the best habitats, which are Serengeti uh, in Tanzania, Mara in Kenya, and Kruger in South Africa, and that's between 1.3 to 2.5. Most of the cheetah's distribution and most of its population are not within protected areas. Things to note again. And these are the population number estimates, but the last bullet is what is most relevant. They assessed 18 populations out of the 33 populations that exist. 14 of them are declining, 3 of them are stable, and only one is increasing. So this is the status in Africa. They have also documented the extinction of 11 populations within protected areas. Zimbabwe has lost 85% of its cheetahs, so I could go on and on. It just, I just want to get your sense of its status in Africa, which is its stronghold. And also look at 
how the numbers are distributed. Two thirds of the existing populations are less than 100 animals. Less than 100 animals is not good news at all. And six of them are less than 10. These are pictures, historical pictures from India. Uh, this is from the Deccan. Uh, these are Asian cheetahs. And this is a distribution of uh, cheetahs in India. So you can see much of India had cheetahs, overlapping with lions, tigers, leopards. And uh, popularly we think 1947 was the last time we had cheetahs, but more recent research has informed us that 1967 is the last confirmed record of cheetahs in India. Cheetahs still exist in Asia, in Iran. The government gives an estimate of about 40 with 12 identified individuals. And I'm happy to share a fairly recent photograph uh, from Iran from September. This is a camera trap image. And these are some images, again paintings, just to show the relationship that Indians had with cheetahs. These are captive animals, you know, held like a house dog or something. To the right of the picture, you see two caracals also. And why was cheetahs captured? To, for sport, something called coursing. They will train these cats, take them out, release them and they'll go and hunt chinkara, black bark, nilgai and they will not be allowed to eat the killed animal. The keepers would go, release the animal, bring the meat back home but the cheetah itself would be given a bit of a meat. Uh, in this picture you can see a cheetah on a leash, uh, it is being blindfolded also. More pictures of keepers and their animals, you can see children, so this is not an animal that often attacks people. Why did it decline? Because since 1550, both males and adult, uh, female adult cheetahs have been captured. When you keep pulling out the reproductive elements out of a population, how do you expect it to survive? To add insult to injury, the British declared a bounty for killing the cheetahs in the 1870s. And of course, the other pressures of hunting, depletion of prey, habitat loss were all there also. This is a long list of history just to tell you that there's a lot that's happening in the context of cheetah introduction, some of it in courtrooms, a lot of it actually is in courtrooms, Supreme Court especially, some in government departments, some in the field, and of course now South Africa and Namibia have all come into play. India has signed MOUs both with Namibia and South Africa for long-term uh, importation of cheetah. But this year has seen a lot more action. Cheetahs have died, cheetahs have been born, Cheetahs have been released from captivity. The released cheetahs have been recaptured. There's been a lot of confusion. There's a changing narrative. Initially, cheetahs were supposed to come from Namibia and South Africa. Now they are saying only from Namibia, South Africa. And more recently, they are saying only from Northern Hemisphere. And I showed you the distribution of cheetahs, where the populations are. All the majority of the populations are south of the equator, which means they are in the Southern Hemisphere. So we really don't know what's happening. Then there's this problem saying, oh, southern south hemisphere animals uh, grow winter coat in the in, uh, northern hemisphere summer. Radio callers are causing deaths, but NTCA says it's all natural. So we really don't know what the truth is. There have also been efforts to change the Supreme Court's position and oversight of this project. Now talking of wanting to introduce into Mukundara, Gandhi Sagar, Nora Dehi. And the final kind of thing is there has been an official gag order issued saying only NTCA and Madhya Pradesh Chief Allah Warren can actually talk about the project. Nobody else within the system can talk about it. This is not a nice happy picture. This is one of the dead cheetahs. You can see uh, the abrasion on the neck. You can see the maggots. And this is what uh, is supposed to have caused a bacterial infection, uh, which resulted in the death of three animals. The whole justification for this cheetah project, Africa has lots of cheetahs. Africa doesn't have space, so India needs to help Africa. That's the kind of argument that's being given. And the cheetahs will come and help save our grasslands. It's not as if India doesn't have native, endangered, charismatic species. And I just listed a few there. I see this project primarily as a diversion of attention from real priority conservation issues, a massive diversion of financial resources. This project is budgeted at 58 million US dollars for the first five years. Not even Project Tiger, Project Elephant get that kind of investment. Just to show our charismatic animals, these are all Indian taken in the wild in India. Couple of wolves outside Pune, Caracal uh, from uh, Ranthambore, 
a recent article saying there are probably less than 50 caracals left in all of India. And of course, my favorite animal, I studied the lions for my PhD. Do they lack charisma? Can't they bring the conservation attention that we are trying to bring to certain habitats? So, I have a few more slides, but given the shortage of time, I'm going to skip through all of this. Oh, you, you should look at this. I mean, these are reports from the government. 92 lions already dead in gear. This is between 1st of January and 30th, 31st of May 2020. 50% of them have died due to diseases. Then in two years, 313 lions have died. These are government reports in the assembly. So, again, don't we have critically endangered species? Bustards, I mean, Sumit is here. We probably have 100 breeding animals at best. And this is, thanks to Sumit through Mr. Musa Khan, a birth very, very recent. What do we have as future for these birds? Look at this. The top panel is habitat in September 2020. The bottom panel is September 22. In two years, what has changed? Bustard is a bird. It flies. What has changed in its habitat? What can you see? Electric wires. How does the bird navigate through this? Similarly, another habitat, two-year difference. Again, you see that. And this is the result. On an average, what, two or three birds get knocked down uh, every year? And when you have a population of only 100, that's too, too heavy a loss for the population. The people are committed. They've even gone to the extent of building a memorial for one of the uh, dead bustards. Desert cats, black buck, striped hyena, desert fox. I mean, these are all animals who open natural ecosystems. I have a few more slides, but Devarati is go probably going to kill me if I go on. So I will hand over to him. So we can take two, three minutes more. Two, three minutes more. Okay. Yeah, sure, please. <laughs> We are investing in cheetahs, but what are we doing to conservation? 47% budget cuts in three years. How are we finding money to invest in a bunch of cheetahs which don't even, even really belong to India? When Project Elephant, Project Tiger and everything else is facing a 47% budget cut. Think about it. What is the goal of the cheetah project? to establish a viable metapopulation so that it will perform its functional role as a top predator, right? What does the science tell us? The cheetahs exist in extremely low densities, very well protected, productive habitats of 10,000 square kilometers can support up to 250 cheetahs, okay? 10,000 square kilometers, keep that number in mind. If the quality is not very good, the same 10,000 square kilometers can only support 4 to 20 <coughs> cheetahs. Average female home range is 750 square kilometers, 760 square kilometers. But that can go as big as 3000 square kilometers. And translocated cats have moved a thousand kilometers. I mean, look at those numbers. This is based on research and see how that squares up with what we are trying to do in India. Essentially the cheetah, you need to view this through the lens of a combination of its inherent wide-ranging behavior and low natural density. It's not a tiger, it's not a lion, it's not a leopard. It's an animal with its own unique spatial ecology. Kuno is only 748 square kilometers. We think at best it can support 10 cheetahs. <clears throat> the action plan says in 15 years, after introducing 50 cheetahs, Kuno will be able to support 21 cheetahs. So look at the equation. If you are an industrialist, Will you make this investment? You put 50 cheetahs in the next 5 to 10 years, and after 15 years, you will have 21 cheetahs. Right? And then, in 30, 40 years, in the larger ecosystem, this 21 will grow to be 36. We think it's a gross overestimate. A lot of us have questioned the suitability of Kuno. The basic fact is, India doesn't have the required extent of quality habitats for cheetahs. Anything less than four to 5,000 square kilometers is a non-starter. Doing 700 here, 200 there, 500 there is not going to make it. At best, you'll have a couple of cheetahs there. A couple of cheetahs don't make a population. A couple of cheetahs are not going to have play the top ecological role. They are not going to have the impact on the uh, required impact on the ecosystem. So, and we do this quite openly. We kind of publish about this. We try and explain scientifically how it needs to be done. But there has not been that much uh, um, kind of engagement.
Last couple of quotes to close. This is Vincent van der Merck, who is one of the movers of the project from South Africa. What does he tell us? This is September last year, even before the cheetahs came. We will lose a tremendous amount of animals, and we know this. Okay, Africa, you know what the status of the cheetah is. We will bring in cheetahs to India, and he knows that we will lose a lot of animals. Given this likelihood, the focus in India should be the long-term plan to regularly supply cheetahs from Africa until the species gets a foothold. A goal that will require a minimum of 500 to 1,000 cheetahs. What is the global population of cheetahs? Do you want to kind of remove those kind of numbers from an already endangered species? So this is the kind of habitat they say the cheetah is going to conserve. Two maps based on research again. The one on the left with the browns is the open habitat. The one on the right with the maroon is wastelands. India has a wasteland atlas. Almost 70% of our open natural ecosystems are categorized as wasteland. We don't need cheetahs to come from Africa to change that categorization. That's an administrative decision. We should just not call our open natural ecosystems wastelands. What will you do with wastelands? We will treat them like waste. We will not treat them with care. Today, these lands are being diverted for green energy projects, for tree plantation. They are getting fragmented. They are getting degraded. We are losing them. Cheetahs are not going to help us save this. So this is a figment of somebody's imagination. There's very poor scientific uh, foundations. Unfortunately, even our worst fears didn't anticipate the kind of setbacks the project has seen in the last year. Even though they're putting up a brave friend saying, we said up to 50% was expected mortality. The mortality is not a sign of uh, success or failure. Today, after 13 months, there's not one single free-ranging cheetah in India. All cheetahs are in captivity. If cheetahs had to be in captivity, why bring them from Africa to India? On that happy note, I shall hand over. Thank you, Dr. Shellam, uh, for <coughs> this insightful presentation. And uh, you have also focused on the ecosystem. I think we cannot talk about any wild animal without its habitat and the interaction with other wild animals. I think this is where this ecosystem approach comes. And you highlighted the status of caracal. Like caracal is a also carnivore, hardly 50 left. It is a truly Indian species, which is the iconic species in the terms of the government, if you see. Uh, then bustard, as Sumit Dukia is sitting here, I think he's one of the topmost scientists working on uh, bustards. Bustards are extinct from entire MP now. I think MP is not yet. Only Rajasthan and some part of Gujarat has bustard. Otherwise, there are sanctuaries of bustard which are now devoid of bustard. There is sanctuary Karela which is by being denutified. So, you know, at one side we are seeing that Indian species which are on the verge of extinction, there is not a, a enough if, a, effort to conserve them. But we are bringing back animals from extinction. And also, like, uh, just to give perspective, uh, now, this is also debatable. I, we had a green mandate with Dr. Ranjit Singh uh, last year in May, uh, just after this lockdown. And that time, this project was still under plan. It was not executed. And he said that, you know, like, you know, the thing was that I asked him that, you know, Asiatic cheetahs are now found only in uh, Iran. And also, the numbers are less than 100. I, I don't know how much is still surviving. And this is African cheetah. They are both suspicious, like... But he said that, you know, you cannot distinguish between African and Asiatic. They are like subspecies of the African and all these things. So, those things were there. So, these issues are there like we are bringing an African cheetah. That's why the topic we have mentioned is introduction of African cheetahs in India. It is not an Asiatic cheetah. It is similarly as we uh, lose our green lions and when we bring, bring lions from Africa thinking that it will be Indian's version. So, it will be not. So this is one thing. Uh, <coughs> so, before I go to this... Uh, discussion about this and I will open it for like questions from audience as well so save your questions we have more than like an hour I think around one hour to ask questions directly to Dr. Chillam he's here only uh, so sir I think you are uh, and actually you are one of the topmost voice like you know critic, uh, critic of the Cheetah project publicly I know many people who are not very happy with the project but they don't speak up much but being a wildlife biologist who have worked on uh, I think your uh, Expertise has been on Asiatic uh, uh, lions. You said that you have done your PhD and uh, this Kuno, I will start from the Kuno because I think the center of controversy is the Kuno National Park in MP. So, uh, uh, so Kuno is uh, not in news in recent time. It has been news since last 10-20 years. 
I have Dr. Sayaz Khud sir. He was also part of Women at Once Upon a Time, and you. So I just two these two topmost scientists. They work on Kuno, and you know they found Kuno is the appropriate habitat for translocation of lions because lions. If something comes, like he showed the data, three hundred lions died in within two years, or one year. It's a huge number. You know, here we are optimistic about seven twenty cheetahs in twenty years, and here three hundred lions are being died. And Kuno was selected as a site for translocation of lions. It was waiting for the lions to arrive from Gir. And there is Supreme Court judgment, 2013 judgment, that you know lions has to be trapped because Gujarat was very uh, like you know said lion is a pride of Gujarat. We have protected it. And the concern, scientific concern, was that if something happens to the lion, then there, is, there should be a second habitat. So Kuno, where lions were supposed to come from Gir, the second habitat of lion, uh, now bringing cheetah. So I want to know you from uh, from you as a biologist. Uh, who as a scientist as also biologist who work on lions so is it the cheetah project uh, bringing african cheetahs which you are opposed to it or you are against the thing that kuno is selected for this project so there are two things or it's a mix of it so i just want to know you from personally what is your uh, what hurts you more <laughs> it's not about what hurts me i mean i hopefully have presented the um, scientific rationale the ecology of the animal and what it requires of course I have since '85 been involved with lions, wanting, and my research was sponsored by the Government of India Wildlife Institute to collect data to inform a translocation. So it's not as if some I wanted a PhD, so I went and studied. After my PhD, I was commissioned to survey North India, West India to find suitable habitats. Through that survey, we found Kono. We recommended to Government of India. Government of India agreed. Government of India released crores of rupees. to madhya pradesh to manage kuno to prepare it for lions so that that involvement is i mean i can't hide it i can't deny it that's what it is my i mean i i saw in your write up online that one of the foremost critics of the project is something to that effect i would like to see myself more coming fighting for the lion and cheetah happens to be one of the obstacles to the lion translocation and if you had given me time i had one of my final slides was in bold why kuno when I mean, if you wanted to bring cheetahs and actually uh, this is something i've written about the ntca when it appealed the 2013 judgments committed to the court that they will not look at kuno they will not interfere with lion translocation it is the commitment government of india made to the court and look where we are the cheetahs have gone only to kuno so there is a rule of law issue there is ecology issue there is the lions of course and when you don't have the space you can dress it whichever way you want how are the cheetahs going to survive i mean africa is its native habitat africa has its best habitat in serengeti kruger 2 2.5 cheetahs per 100 square kilometers so so any which way you look at it i don't see the logic the scientific rationale the conservation prioritization financial viability i mean there's a lot more there than uh, but to directly answer your question it started with the lions but very soon the more i read about cheetahs i realized it's a non starter yeah thank you for <laughs> being honest about it uh, so and you uh, this question my question this question next question is uh, to the presentation also you have shown that grasslands are threatened and you shown the how the wires are being brought up and all this thing so uh, but the argument given by the government i think this is repeated everywhere that we want to bring the focus to grassland now your argument is very valid that why you want cheetahs for it but tell me one thing uh, for suppose like you know the habitat is still there and kuno is still there so do you think because of this uh, introduction of cheetah uh, the government of india has uh, or the park managers has done some like you know there is some change in the habitat because of cheetah because cheetah's habitat lions habitat i don't know i'm not a biologist i conservation biologist like you but what i read is that uh, there has been change in the habitat because it was being prepared for lions introduction and there are some prey species which are not present anymore in kuno because they and they prepared this park for lion thinking lion lion is a different kind of uh, like you know predator cheetahs are different so can you throw some light as a conservationist what change you have seen in kuno 
in between this lion translocation and cheetah translocation project and how it is going to affect uh, other species which are there because in the cheetah conservation action plan it was written that there may be a need to manage population of wolves, cheetahs and other carnivores. I don't know what the management means, maybe taking out the animal or culling them, I don't know. This term management is a very broad term. It was there in the cheetah management plan that you know uh, there may be need to manage other carnivores. So in this management do you think the this habitat of Puno can change? To change a habitat requires fairly drastic intervention over long period of time over large spatial scales. It's not a back garden. It's hundreds of square kilometers. So it's not easy to change habitat that way. The fact of the matter is for the lines to be translocated about 1500 families uh, nearly 30 villages were resettled. As a result the native vegetation has definitely come back. Kuno is not your typical open natural ecosystem. It's, it's dry deciduous forest. Uh, there are patches of grassland, but it is essentially a dry deciduous forest. It has had tigers before. Okay? It has had lions before. It continues to have leopards, sloth bear, hyena, uh, wolves, uh, occasional dole also. So, and I've not been there since 2016. So I can't tell you what the more recent changes are. But the action plan released in January 22 records that Kuno is the most suitable habitat because it has been managed for the translocation of lions. That it's well protected, it has sufficient prey species. But more recently, starting from March of this year, the same people who are involved in writing the management, uh, the action plan and other South African and Namibian scientists are now saying Kuno is not suitable. That Kuno prey densities have dropped suddenly. Suddenly Kuno has become too small. I mean Kuno has always been the size it's been. So we don't know what to believe. From official uh, sources you're getting conflicting uh, opinions. But I, <coughs> I want to counter this uh, with a statement by an NTC officer, topmost officer, in this interview, I think, New York Express I was reading. So he said in the interview that uh, Kuno is actually better habitat than the South Africa also. This is his statement. This is published. Okay. I'm audible now. Oh. Okay. Okay. My bad. So I will repeat my question. Uh, so coming to this habitat and uh, this thing, so uh, you are saying that now experts are saying this is not a suitable habitat anymore. But very recent interview in New York Express published of the NTC at topmost officer, he said that uh, Kuno is a like you know selected after being all the studies done and uh, there has been no unnatural death. There also been stayed, and he has shown the picture like there are maggots and all. So, but he also said that this is very. I'm quoting from there like you know. That Kuno was selected based on scientific studies and deemed superior to South Africa's habitat for cheetah introduction. The, 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 the government of, uh, officers, uh, like you know, they are saying, NTC is saying, there's a statement. So uh, <laughs> I want to hear from you. So when uh, like uh, government of India is saying, uh, NTC is saying it is better habitat than uh, Africa. So do you believe uh, in this? Like, what is thoughts about it? See, in one of my first slides I gave you a range of uh, habitat quality across yes. Africa. I showed you that cheetahs exist in as low densities as 0 0.25 to about 2.5 cheetahs. So it depends when you say Africa, are you looking at the 0 0.25 density or are you looking at 2.5 density? I don't know. I also shown you a calculation where 10,000 square kilometers can have up to 250 cheetahs or can have as low as 4 to 20 cheetahs. So there's no way I can counter it. Data has to be provided. Opinions are opinions. Yeah. So I think it was more being optimistic about the project and <laughs> science will take its course when we see because it was just one year down the lane. Uh, <clears throat> so now, <clears throat> uh, this is like when uh, we were having a discussion on this, when it was originally proposed. So one officer, uh, like you know, because he is from that part, he's so, so the original thinking was that we want to see all the four big carnivores in a single habitat, like lion, cheetah, tiger and leopard. It's a wishful thinking. 
we should have all the four top carnivores in a single habitat which we have lost and the argument given was cheetah is the only animal which got extinct in last 75 years of independence of india maybe next is get bust in and buster i don't know we are able to save it i hope uh, i'm wrong uh, but cheetah is the only species which is uh, extinct from india and this is something we need to take corrective action and uh, this is the right path and the to quote him he said and this thing quote said that you know one who goes far they become more dear uh, so this is the original thinking so uh, right now clearly from your presentation like you are not very uh, hopeful about kuno so uh, no don't get me wrong hmm. do we have 10000 square kilometers talk to me when you have 10000 square kilometers. i don't think any pn in india so, has 10000 so let's not talk about why you wasting yeah. our time yeah sure 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 definitely so uh, but do you think uh, like suppose for example i assume that this project becomes successful 20 years just assume 1% chance even more than chance is it's successful maybe five cheetahs are surviving now so and this five cheetahs are freely breeding freely moving whatever they are doing or they have adapted to the indian conditions this is like assume let's assume so do you think this india as a conservationist this four carnivores can survive together in a uh, 1000 square kilometer habitat your final point is what adds context to it it is space people think the tigers drove the lions away there is no logic there historically in india there have been habitats where lions tigers leopards and even cheetahs would have coexisted but at what scale it is in that landscape scale why because tigers and leopards would take the more rugged wetter habitats lions and cheetahs would take the more flatter and open habitats today in africa lions and cheetahs live together right and tigers have been in gujarat lions have been all the way to bengal cheetahs i showed you the overlap so it's not as if they have not within courts coexisted it's not like you and me sitting next to each yes. other right so animals find their way there will be clash occasionally one animal will kill the other and so on and so forth but we are talking of decades and centuries of evolution and adjustment so suddenly bring your few cheetahs from africa to recreate this garden of eden i don't know but uh, ecology and environmental history tells us that historically they would have coexisted <coughs> so now uh, in your presentation also you showed that uh, there are three four more uh, sanctuary nation park in india which are now considered for introduction of cheetah nora dehi and the three four gandhi sagar yeah and sagar three four so uh, in your opinion like even in a limited scale or whatever so what do you think can be a success like if there has to be success we have to measure the success of this project then what those parameters would be i think you have already answered some part of it but suppose we introduce cheetahs in some nearby neighboring pas and we somehow able to create the corridors and maintain it uh, what will be the like you know success to we can say it is a success project even if in limited scale for the cheetahs with any reintroduction program the success is defined by persistence of the population in the sense that you will say it will take 10 years 15 years 20 years how whatever timeline and you will introduce so many animals at the end of that the population will become self sustained that will become the success but again i go back to the thing without a home without a habitat how can you start a family so that's going to be the challenge and the few weeks that we've had the cheetahs ranging free in india they have had a team of four or five people tagging it every minute of its life so that also is not a good sign for me how do you expect an animal to settle down be wild if you have so much scrutiny over its day to day so, life so this uh, brings the second question follow up question to it so in this last one year there are occasions when cheetahs ventured out it's a natural like in habitat they want to go out make new territories or find prey it's an instinct so uh, but we have seen that uh, they have been tranquilized some from the border of mp trying to cross some other places so this is one thing which actually opposite to what you are saying we want it us to naturalize and making territories but here we are also tranquilizing them bringing back to the kuno this is one thing i want to open secondly 
when cheetahs goes out of pas or some other region inside pas also the issue of feral dogs like not feral is not a good term free ranging domestic dogs so domestic dogs which are free ranging in india we have free ranging dogs so basically is just to give a context it is not like community dogs which you see here same species but they are naturalized in the open environment so they become just like a carnivore but they compete with the wild animals so now there are two aspects one is the issue of interaction of cheetahs with this free ranging dog which are already menaced in some places they are driving out many carnivores and they are causing this distemper can disease dis canine distemper disease in animals and this is a menace now everyone accepts this thing scientifically free ranging dogs are problem in the wildlife habitats now when cheetahs go outside cheetahs are not very aggressive as other tiger or leopard this is one thing so how do you think like do two questions here two question one is bringing back these animals when the venching of this this is happening secondly interaction with this free ranging dogs and all if you are the uh, manager of this project then what would have been your plan of action to deal this two situations so clearly in the realms of imagination and a very hypothetical course yes, we had one year so <laughs> as much so, as only um i don't think the right approach is to capture and bring back the released animal if you want and cheetahs are wide ranging i told you they can move up to 1000 kilometers after they've been moved in this case i think the name of the cheetah was pavan he was the first cheetah released from namibia <clears throat> after some time he went out he was brought back he was released he went out again they went and captured him again now is this a way to even treat a wild animal the wild animals also have some self respect no so the and how you are dealing with the psychology animals depend on scent animal depends on so many things you move an animal out of its habitat its scent is no longer there there are whole host of other things happen so to me this is more a management to try and show you are managing rather than allow ecology and conservation science to inform your management or the fear that it might die you know you those are the kind of things driving rather than the real welfare of the animal dying is not bad that's the only guarantee in all our lives okay so you can't allow the fear of death to dominate how you intervene if you want to establish a population you have to let the animal range free that's a long question to one of your uh, answer to one of your question what is the second question uh, this was on capture and bringing back the, the second was on the free ranging dogs interaction oh, see india people and dogs i mean you go everywhere where which which square kilometer of india is going to be free and these are again risks we have flagged um, both from a disease perspective and these dogs can gang up into our pack and that's what's happening in ladakh and uh, himalayas they did this ravaging our uh, resident uh, wildlife so fortunately till now that's not happened but that's a present danger i mean that's that's a real danger then of course our roads in iran the major mortality for cheetahs of the few cheetahs left is getting hit by traffic so our roads you know how people drive and so you see in south africa these cheetahs Uh, at least in south africa not southern african south africa other than kruger these cheetahs are held in fenced reserves reserves which can range from about 100 square kilometers to 1000 or more square kilometers india does not have fenced reserves because people also access the resources in so so south african ideas transplanted into india without really thinking things through not looking at the spatial ecology of the cheetah so a lot of foundational errors that we've done Yeah. and i won't ask the question for underpass and overpass because clearly i don't think uh, we can uh, discuss about whether this is successful in for all the species so uh, let's not go into that but uh, now my last question before i uh, open it up this is uh, more like a social and political question like we have seen like recently uh, most of the conservation initiative uh, the focus is on tourism and we have seen that not only cheetah uh, even tigers which were like you know there are areas where tigers are never reported historically now we want to introduce tigers in those parts like kumbhalgarh in rajasthan uh, it was sanctuary people are living inside that is been 
declared as national park and people are being dispelled uh, without tiger see it is declared tiger reserve without tiger and plans to introduce tiger why because a local mp uh, proposed that you know this uh, area should be developed and you know tourism can bring more money more uh, employment and you know if we declare tiger reserve then you can have safaris and you know all this thing and the term used everywhere is eco tourism even in the last uh, forest conservation amendment act if you see the all the documents of sustainable development in g20 everywhere this eco tourism is now highlighted everywhere it is a like sugar coating everything like like you know this is same thing now uh, <clears throat> there are tigers of where there don't no tigers like you go to palamu in jharkhand one of the oldest tigers of no tiger baksa in west bengal oldest but no tiger and there are new species where you want to introduce tiger historically at the cost of people this is one thing there's a local opposition from the people that you know we don't want this tiger reserve but no because the government wants it so uh, and there is also like uh, if you want to have a lo- more uh, local example then uh, aravalli this safari park is planned on 10000 acres of land so we could have done some introduction of local species there maybe busted in aravalli but we want to bring some zebras and i don't know it's a very fancy term so now this whole focus on safari ecotourism building big infrastructure within forests and habitats and creating zoos like it's, it's i will say it's a zoo because you know even cheetah project they are being captured and kept in a like you know wild kind of fencing thing when the wild portion act and you have uh, started working since this act was enacted i think <laughs> so you have seen the whole history of the how it was uh, like you know originally brought and implemented what challenges it has gone through initial focus has been on the species and some fancy looking habitats maybe i am right because initially if it is the sanctuary national park there are the places which looks beautiful and some species iconic species rhinoceros or tiger all this kind of thing now the focus conservation scientists are more work talking about other species but now the common policies we are seeing is shifting away from species more to the iconic and mixing between tourism and like this thing so uh, first is like do you think there is a transformation in the government policies towards conservation as such how they see conservation how they perceive conservation how they measure success to it and what do you think is driving this shift unfortunately for most of us um, there's a strong streak of ecological illiteracy and technological arrogance we think technology can solve our, all our problems there's also a, a fundamental mismatch of timelines ecology evolution works in a very different timelines corporate results and um, countries elections and state elections operate in a completely different timeline how do you navigate this is actually bring an ethical issues i mean issues related either to the environment or local communities have to be viewed really through what is right and what is wrong and not what is profitable and what is not profitable nature has shown us repeatedly in the last 10 years don't even go very far back i mean uttarakhand floods what is happening in joshimat himachal bangalore floods i mean bombay floods literally every monsoon you have flood and every summer there's no water why is this happening not because nature wants it to happen because we built in such a way we i mean the chardam project every thing is on record people have warned you but we continue doing these kind of things so to, we have to pay the price for it no but, but it, what is driving this change like driving i told you hmm. corporate results are every quarter elections are every 4 5 or 6 years our short term thinking our inability to use ethics and morals and right and wrong in our lives certain things should not be done whatever the price to try and put a price on everything when I mean, you put a price on forest yeah can you create a forest can you grow a forest when you put a price on a forest so anybody who has enough money who can bid for it will you put a price on your family member next I mean, that's that's what it's come to why do we see ourselves being superior to nature or apart from nature we we are also nature i mean we are also biodiversity i mean that thinking that nature of viewing things has to change unless that fundamental outlook doesn't change i mean look at what happened in australia the forest fires california europe then followed by floods it's it's going to happen everywhere and we will have no answer when when nature strikes you can say you have technology and all of that 
You, you've seen it. I don't have to tell you. I mean, it's all so yes. recent. Definitely. Yeah, so uh, I stop my <coughs> questions uh, here. Uh, and we can open it up for more, uh, like, you know, questions from audience if they have any. Is somebody carrying a mic yeah, for them? Yeah, mic is there. Yeah. So we have enough time so we can have a good discussion. Yeah, there's somebody there. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Chair. I had a question. You refer to uh, the kind of numbers of cheetahs that we have to that would perish in this project. The number you put up with a fine up to 1,000 cheetahs. That's a homicide. So why, why aren't large groups like uh, the IUCN Cardio group, why are they not looking at this and saying, no, we cannot let this happen? It may be one country's vanity project, but surely there are other groups that should see some sense. I'm glad you're asking that question. I think uh, the more and more of us raise our voices right, directly with IUCN, go on record. I have been um, given the respect of no response. I've written to the chairman of IUCN Cat Specialist Group. I've sent reminders and I've been treated like a non-entity. So I can't speak on behalf of IUCN I do plan to take it up with the IUCN country director who happens to be a dear colleague and friend. So unfortunately he's traveling now, but next time I'm in Delhi, that's something I'm going to take it up with him. I think, uh, and those numbers are not my numbers. Uh, let me make that very clear. Those are numbers quoted by one of the main movers of the project. But forget uh, the fate of the cheetahs, the moral, ethical issues associated with it. The African population can't afford to lose that number of animals. You, you will end up endangering the African population. And people have written, Africans have written about it now. Uh, one of the papers is called, Why Are We Sinking African Cheetahs in India? So, in the last year, there has been a far more open debate. But large institutions and people who should know better, who should hold. But everybody is in some sense beholden to India, right? We are the behemoth, we are the growth economy, blah, blah, blah. I don't know whether I answered you, though. Um, thank you for the speech. It was really enlightening. I just had a question on... The point you raised about designation of certain areas as wastelands, right? And how that has certain, how this designation is leading to the, those areas being used for green energy projects and the likewise. So um, could you just highlight a little bit more about that process? What are the metrics for that designation and what are the particular implications of that? It's our obsession with the tall and the green. We look at tall evergreen forests as good forest. And something else is bad forest. It starts with that. That comes again from an ecological illiteracy point of view. Natural vegetation is expressed as a function of the terrain, the soil conditions, the temperature range, the rainfall. It's not something that we decide. I mean, nature decides for itself what is the appropriate vegetation form it should grow. So, when it comes to these open natural ecosystems, I showed you a photograph as to what it looks like. A typical forester or a typical policy wonk is going to look and say, that is wasteland. The trees are not 25 feet high or 30 feet high. It's not evergreen forest. So it comes from that mindset. And unfortunately, India seems to have fallen into this trap of wanting to do everything the biggest, uh, the largest. I don't know what. I mean, we have the largest solar farm. So what? I mean, what is the cost of having the large, large solar farm? Solar farm requires fresh water and you put solar farms in dry areas, where are you going to get the fresh water to clean the panels? There's no real thinking on these things. And Indian citizens seem to have lost their voice. Local communities definitely have it, but many of us sitting in cities are within courts leading a relatively comfortable life. We don't engage enough with issues outside our daily life. I think if we want India to be whatever our visions are for that India, we will have to invest more in that. I don't know again whether I answered your question. 
Here, here. Yellow shirt. So, uh, you spoke about how certain African wildlife conservators are fenced. Uh, so, if you would, uh, would fencing national parks such as the Kuno National Park help or improve the conditions in any manner? Uh, can you define more what you mean by improve conditions? Uh, for example, uh, with, with the example of cheetahs. So, if we fence the Kuno National Park and then release the cheetahs, would it would it help in any manner or improve their conditions from what they were now? They're already within fences. No, but like a larger area. Say so, so is this a zoo, a safari park, or wildlife sanctuary? A wildlife sanctuary. But why is it fenced then? Because uh, cheetahs are not the only thing moving back and forth. There are a lot of things moving back and forth. And India, even according to the government does not have a policy, does not fit our ethos to fence our reserves. Fencing is not cheap. One kilometer of using uh, old railway line, they do that in South India for elephants. One kilometer is something like five crores. Is that the best use of our money? And, and it's an ecological dead end. Please use ecology and not civil engineering to manage our wildlife. Yeah. Uh, so you talk about, uh, talked about how uh, Uno was going to be the place where the lions were going to be translocated. So why do you think that did not happen or uh, and why was it so crucial or is rather so crucial that they are translocated? Before I answer your question, you have to remember that the Supreme Court on 15th of April 2013 explicitly ordered the translocation of lions. The exact text is in letter and spirit, lines should be translocated within six months. 15th of April 2013, six months according to me, is 14th of October 2013. Today is 19th of October 2023. So to me, all the science, conservation, every other argument is moot. Because you're all students of law, right? What do you do when the Supreme Court gives a judgment? What should you do? No. Do, contempt if you don't do or, or follow it, but your primary intention, motive should be to follow the Supreme Court judgment, right? So, to me, I will answer your question, but unless we frame it like this, uh, it's noise. Because there is a standing order of the Supreme Court saying, within six months, translocate lines. From, and it is very explicit. From Gir to Kuno, it doesn't say translocate lines. It tells you where to source the lines and where to release the lines. Now, if I remember your question rightly, you are saying why it doesn't happen. I can't find a more diplomatic way of saying it. I would say it's impunity. That certain people believe they are above the law. Unfortunately, the courts are not even recognizing this. In 2016, there was a contempt petition filed. It came up for hearing in late 2017. And then in a hearing in March 2018, the government said, we will hold a meeting. The contempt petition was why lines were not translocated, but the government got away by saying, we'll hold a meeting. That meeting is still to be held. March 2018, they gave that assurance. <coughs> and the court, without cause, without stating the reasons, dismissed the contempt petition. More recently, another contempt petition has been filed. It is going through the court. We'll have to wait and see what happens there. The official reason, on paper, Gujarat keeps saying IUCN guidelines have not been followed. So, lines cannot be translocated. Have the IUCN guidelines been followed for the cheetahs? If Kuno is good enough for African cheetahs, they are definitely good enough for our own neighboring lions to come from. The reasons given for cheetahs, I told you, African cheetah population is surplusing. They don't have space for cheetahs. But that's not true. The IUCN itself has very clearly, I showed you the numbers, the status of cheetahs. And what? 14 out of 18 populations are actually declining. So there is no basis for that. And even if that was true, is it India's responsibility to conserve African cheetahs? So that was one question. What is the... Why is it like so much 
Ah, yeah. What brings to mind when I say all your eggs are in one basket? What is what what meaning do you have when you hear that? All your eggs are in one basket. Okay? So all of us hopefully will have some form of insurance, life insurance, medical insurance. We don't take it thinking we'll die tomorrow or we'll fall sick tomorrow. The question is, it's a safety net. The lions have gone through what is called as a genetic bottleneck. In the late 1800s, early 1900s, the lion population was estimated variously as being less than 20, about 12 and so on and so forth. I wouldn't pay too much attention to those exact numbers because I think even today our exact numbers are a bit off. But it showed that they were close to extinction. Lions have made a remarkable comeback. We need to recognize how successful we have been in conserving the lions. But if you have 12, 20, 200, 800 and they are all in one basket, if the basket falls. So that was the reason. Disease is a killer, is a real killer. I showed you some uh, data for that. But how it played out in the best of the lion habitat, in the largest lion population was in 1994. The Serengeti Mara ecosystem had 3,000 lions. Canine distemper and babesiosis, there was an episode of that. In three weeks, 1,000 lions died. When we told this to Gujarat, they said, oh, Africa. Yes, our Indian lions are not here. Science Kabhi to respect karo. And that's what happened in 2018. Three dozen lions died in a matter of days. Three dozen lions were taken into captivity in 2018. Three other, other I mean, uh, another pride. Those lions are still in captivity. 2018 now, 2023. Five years they've been in captivity. So they've been lost to the wild population. The official number is about 40 lions died. I know for a fact a lot more died. Three, four times that number of lions died in those two, three months. September, October, November, December 2018. And lions are continuing to die. So we don't want to tempt fate. And the whole idea is Kuna is more than a thousand kilometers away. So even if an earthquake strikes or a forest fire strikes or a disease strikes, the chance of the same event happening at two places is not going to be there. The current population estimate is about 800 lions, of which more than 400 are not within the forest. They are in villages, they are in somebody's backyard, your front yard, some go down, roads, railways, cities. I mean, if I had the opportunity, I can show you some stunning videos. There are people at night inside a house, and these are village homes, fortunately concrete. There's an open staircase and an open balcony, or the, whatever you call it, top floor. And there's a lioness sitting and roaring there. There is another security camera footage of a hotel in Junagadh. Heavy traffic, 5 a.m. A uh, young male lion comes, jumps the gate, goes into the basement parking, explodes for about half a minute, comes back, jumps out and goes. And there are motorbikes going, cars going. And the security guard, each time the gate rattles, he wakes up uh, to see. By then the line has come and gone. He doesn't know what has happened. So there is enough and more evidence of what is happening. Lines have to learn to navigate traffic now. In heavy traffic, lines are going through. So, and the government of India paid for me to go and do the studies to inform the translocation. And as I said, the 2013 judgment is still valid. So, I can give you, I can keep talking when it comes to lines. <laughs> you will have to ask me to stop. Mm. So on, on the mic, please. On the mic, on the mic. Because we're recording. <clears throat> so, like, is it sort of like a prestige issue to create like an exclusivity that only Gail has lions or something like that? Is it something? The lions evolved in Africa. Yeah. Okay? They didn't evolve in Gujarat. <laughs> you have to remember that. But I think what his point was that uh, because Gujarat has been successful in uh, saving the lions from extinction and they want to take the credit that, you know, because of us, 
we have saved the line and we should be like given the greed and we don't want to share that thing maybe that is what he is trying to ask who is denying any credit to gujarat gujarat has done well but has gujarat done it alone you want water from madhya pradesh to aap narmada pani mat lo na you can't have it both ways but the supreme court order yeah rest of it is noise it will be nice to have your names you all know my name so sir i am yush gupta from second year so one of the things that i was like that intrigued me was that we have been looking at this whole relocation project from the perspective from the perspective that will cheetah survive or whether the whole whether the kumbh national park or india stand is suitable for cheetah or not So, what is the impact of bringing cheetahs to India, African cheetahs, which is essentially a foreign species uh, for India, on the other species that are living in Kumbh National Park? Because even that is a very important determinant of you know viability or the suitability of bringing them here. Is it possible that bringing cheetahs here will destroy the diversity, already existing diversity in these parks? It will have an impact, but will have an impact that will not be visually visible. what i mean is it's not going to impact large vertebrates or something that you can see it is going to happen at the microbial level it could be bacteria they carry diseases they carry or diseases they get in india i suspect some of the deaths in july were due to a disease they were not uh, the african cheetahs were not exposed to uh very good question uh but the thing is when conservation is never the goal uh, these questions will not even appear in people's mind they say they have done a disease surveillance and so on and so forth if all of that is true why are the cheetahs still in captivity that's the question i keep coming back to you brought them to release them in the wild you brought them to save your grasslands your great indian bustard or whatever why you keep capturing and bringing them back into captivity how are they going to do their job Come to come, they have to be able to go somewhere, no? And few weeks you leave them, few weeks you capture them, and each tranquilization raises the risk of their death. I mean, human patients drive under anesthesia. Yeah, you're dealing with free-ranging cats. It's not easy, and it's expensive. They have four people, twenty-four-seven, behind every single cheetah, and that's dealing with seven, eight cheetahs. Imagine you have twenty cheetahs out. How many cars? How many people? Doesn't make sense. Hi, I am Anu from Assam. Do you don't you think we should be redirecting our efforts towards the conservation of Asiatic cheetahs in Iran? We should be helping Iran instead. Like in the long run, it could be beneficial for us. Like in a hypothetical world, let's say there are a lot of Asiatic cheetahs in Iran. We have a good relation with Iran, and then we bring one of them to Kuno. Do you think that? Like, they will adapt in a much better way compared to african cheetah because they come from a different continent different climate i don't i am not that knowledgeable when it comes to climate of africa and india comparatively but don't you think they can adapt much in a much better way again a very interesting question very layered question first iran is in the northern hemisphere so tick mark second it's the same sort of species that used to occur in india another tick mark In fact, I showed you the title of one of the papers we wrote. That is where we have said, why don't we invest in Iran? This amount of money can help, uh, hopefully. Uh, but whether it will adapt better, the answer is I don't know, because the current <coughs> population of Iranian cheetahs lives essentially in a cold desert, in a place like Ladakh. Okay. Kuno is not Ladakh, so I don't know whether they will adapt better. But again, we are all asking the wrong question. My question is, where is the ten thousand square kilometers? Show me the ten thousand square kilometers. Uske baad baat karenge. Yes, please. I mean, the floor is open. <coughs> uh, my name is Anita. Uh, 
has there been any successful translocation of cheetahs out of Africa? Into fenced habitats, not into free ranging. Why is that? Okay, can you give me a few minutes to explain that? Large cats also live in a hierarchy. The largest are, of course, lions and tigers. They seldom will overlap. Then comes the common leopard and then the cheetah. How does the leopard manage? It lives in the first floor. It basically climbs trees, so it's able to escape tigers and lions. Cheetahs cannot do that. Cheetahs have speed on their side. So an adult cheetah could potentially outrun a leopard, a lion or a tiger. But a cub doesn't have that ability. So what is the evolutionary adaptability? It tends to naturally exist in much lower density. If you are scars, how often will you then meet the larger cat? So that's the adaptive kind of tendency of the animal. So it naturally occurs in low density, which is why it needs those vast spaces. And your viable populations, you're talking of 50 to 100 adults, you know, randomly mating for genetic diversity to be preserved, which is why you're talking of this 5 to 10,000 square kilometers. Without that, it's going to be a joke. Uh, it's going to be a safari park or whatever else. Okay, now I've forgotten your question. Sorry. Why is translocation possible only in fenced habitat? Oh, uh, yeah. In fenced habitat, you restrict the animal's movement. Obviously, it cannot go further. Not only that, you tend to stock it with much larger number of prey. So, and you will control the number of lions and leopards and things. So, the, at one level, the threat is reduced. And second, you're making it like uh, a supermarket in terms of food. And cheetahs also learn to what is called as run their prey against the fence. So they'll chase a prey and the prey fearing the cheetah's predation will forget there's a fence and go bash against it and die. And cheetah will then pick it off. So that's, that's, and to also answer, you, I forget you or somebody else said, uh, about free ranging uh, translocation succeeding. In August 21, two such attempts have been made. Several have been made in the past, they've failed. Two such attempts have been made in Africa, August 21, and they reported in February 23 that it's successful. But that's too short a timeline to claim success. So I didn't mention that, but uh, in full disclosure, I should say that. Uh, sir, if I may, uh, what was mentioned, why we are not focusing on uh, you know, Iran or Asian uh, cheetah. I heard Dr. Ranjit Singh in one of the session, and he explained that among all the four big cats, cheetah are the only ones which have least amount of differentiation in terms of geography. And that's why I think uh, he explained why we opted Africa and not some other country. Uh, just wanted your take on that, that, you know, uh, he, that was his perspective that I heard. Did you say geography or genetic diversity? Yeah, he said that uh, among all the four big cats, the diversity, the genetic di uh, diversity is the least among cheetahs. One is genetic diversity, other is behavioral adaptation. There's a lot more to it than just genetics. Today, genetics is not playing out in Kono. So, you can always come up with arguments to support your viewpoint. Is it scientific or not is a completely different question. It's like the NTCHR person saying, uh, who knows better habitat than South Africa? What does that even mean? Now, if cheetah has low genetic diversity, it doesn't mean, I mean, why are they now saying that uh, these cheetahs have come from Southern Africa, so we have a winter coat problem? Where is the genetics in this? I showed you one photograph of what has happened to one of the cheetahs. We, I, we don't know what the truth as to what really happened, what is the cost. But that was the result. So I, I don't get it. I am not getting into the genetics of it at this point of time because there are far more immediate. Genetics doesn't operate on a daily basis. It's going to operate over decadal time frames. And that, that cannot be the justification. And I don't think we are suggesting get cheetahs from Iran today. We are suggesting invest in Iran today. Build the conservation capacity. Help the Asiatic cheetah survive. Bringing cheetahs from Africa to India is not conservation. Let's make that very, very clear. It is not conservation. So, just I want to <coughs> add to it because I was moderating the session with Ranjit Singh. So, he said that our men will be trained enough 
our our men like indian scientists have trained enough and they can revive chita in iran if they are successful here this is his reply to that <laughs> anyway next question <laughs> Hi, uh, my name is Nikita. Thank you so much for this interesting talk. Uh, in the very beginning of your presentation, you referred to the fact that uh, this look, this transfer, I mean, this uh, Chita project uh, could also be used to divert attention from other conservation issues. I just want to know what exactly are you uh, do you mean by this? Is it specifically with respect to certain species, charismatic species, or is it wildlife in general or something else okay if you've been reading the newspapers and if you've been looking at wildlife news over the last 13 14 months how much of that has been cheetah how much of that has been non cheetah i mean i follow it closely i follow wildlife news closely i follow cheetahs closely i try and file save because I should not be found out. I mean, saying that I made a mistake and things like that. I, I follow this very, very closely. So, and for even for somebody like me who spent forty years doing this kind of work, the cheetah news has been overwhelming. Second, the introduction of cheetahs to Kuno is not about cheetahs. It's about one more attempt to delay, stymie, prevent the translocation of lions. I didn't have time to get into it. The action plan states. it will take at least 15 years for the cheetahs to settle down after introduction at least 15 years once the cheetahs have established themselves then lions can be translocated did anybody ask them for permission the supreme court is very clear in 2013 when it said translocate lions in 6 months the action plan goes to the extent of saying we will introduce cheetahs it will take 15 years at least for them to settle down uske baad you can bring lions isn't that an obstacle 58 million US dollars for conservation has anybody heard that amount for any other species in this country i showed you a slide which shows 47% budget cut is that not a distraction they will say it's new money find the new money for our native species no so we can always frame these arguments to somehow support the indefensible i'm not saying you uh, as administrators that's what they are doing giving one tall tale after the other the narrative is constantly changing unless you keep track it looks like one day you were in mars next day you were in jupiter because the whole story about the cheetahs have changed and they're making this up as they go along i don't think they know what they're doing hello sir i'm uh, sir thank you so I'm Madhu Sudhir. Hi, Madhu. So, while talking about breaking back cheetahs who try to move out of Kuno National Park, you said that showcasing your managing is uh, the more important thing here is to let the wildlife inform your managing. So, I wanted to ask, like, where do you draw this line between controlling the complete habitat and just facilitating it? Like, when these species are foreign species and they are prone to epidemic diseases, you have to keep a surveillance. But where do you draw this line of completely managing it? and just facilitating it complicated question um this is not a zoo in a zoo in a safari park you are responsible you brought them into captivity so you bloody well make sure you know what you're doing in wild you need to keep an eye you need to monitor but you can't be disrupting their life imagine your parents every other day saying no 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 you can't go on that road catching you and bringing you back home every day how will you feel and you are not even depending on your nose to determine where you need to go these cats are primarily using smells to determine what their habitat is and you move an animal out of its habitat that smell is no longer going to be there it is bad not just for cheetahs it's bad for tigers it's bad for leopards it's bad for lions so those 33 lions that were moved in october 2018 captured so that they can be vaccinated against canine distemper virus are now condemned to spend the rest of their life in captivity yes they are alive but what does alive being alive even mean see our wildlife management has to be informed by ecology has to be informed by animal behavior has to be informed by ethics today it is 
more managing public perception. I mean, I'm not at all undermining the quality of the work they are doing, but very important issues related to ecology, animal behavior is not incorporated into management. It's not informing management. I mean, India has clearly done a wonderful job in wildlife conservation. And a variety of people, variety of sectors have contributed to it. 1.4 billion people, so many poor people, so many people depending on the land and biomass for their day-to-day -day existence. Still having thriving populations of, I mean, we are the envy of the world. The world can't understand how India does it. Which is why trying to fence, bring cheetahs, it's not the Indian model. It's not cost effective. I think we can take one or two more questions then. <clears throat> yeah, this side has been silent. Yes. <laughs> no, no, you can ask. You raised your hand first. Next woman. Hello, sir. Uh, myself, Divaka Vikram Singh, and I'm doing a research on forest restoration in, uh, in the open forest of Pune National Park. I'm from GJS Appu. Um, sir, uh, nobody is talking all about the low, re le uh, low regeneration in that area, and the forest community, which is Shaharia community, is there. They collect the for they are forest developers, and they collect the whole lot of things from the forest, and they sell out to the local market. And there are the big distributors who collect, and the Patanjali ghee and the Patanjali achar and everything reach to our homes, and nobody and they get very low income. Their prime uh, job is to collect the small uh, collectives from the forest. Okay, and this cheetah introduction, as you have mentioned, that near about 30 villages, but uh, uh, might be you were right, uh, but I have read that 25 villages have been moved from uh, the uh, center of that Kuno National Park and shifted to new places. And uh, that is near Vijaypur. And what is, I'm seeing there is the people who have been shifted there, the forest near that area has been under the more tremendous low regeneration because they are getting all their things like they want to make houses, they wanted to collect that uh, their collective which they sell to have their livelihood, have increasing pressure on the forest. And the forest is certainly connected to uh, the cheetah or other wild animals. So what's your take on that, sir? Please, it, sir. What's the question? There's a long uh, presentation. What is the question? Sir, my 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 question is that forest having a low regeneration there, and where the livelihood comes for the local people, which is known, which are the PVTG. There are only 75 PVTG in the whole lot of India. But how they uh, there is low regeneration? So how uh, will com uh, comment on the African cheetah introduction? to the low regeneration of the forest. How you can connect and your views on that? I don't see a connection because... Because sir, there is a connection because uh, because cheetah lives in the forest and there is a lot of... or like to talk about bus, uh, busted species. And uh, there are certainly many more species which could be under threat if the forest getting clearer and clearer further due to shiftings of the forest developers from that area? No, there are far more fundamental problems. The Forest Rights Act is, is the law of the land. You can't just go pick up people and move them. The forest dwelling tribes, especially PVTGs, have rights. So under the FRA, they first need to be given rights. If they're being moved without giving them rights, that's illegal. So there's very little I can comment on illegal activities. Now on low regeneration from an ecological perspective, Low regeneration compared to what? If you're comparing it to some other habitat, that might not be a valid comparison. Do we have baselines from this forest to know what was so natural? Also, previously, the people were able to collect lots of lots so, and lots of tendu patta, and their uh, tendu patta is used to uh, making BDs, and that is transplanted. Uh, no, I know that. I know that. Yes. So, but. Are there ecological studies to determine what was the regeneration status? Yes, sir. There is, uh, uh, basically 30 years back, my professor done the ecological studies on that. Uh, in his time, there are uh, law, uh, near about 30 trucks in a, in a day or a season. No, no, not. Don't use the volume of leaves going out. 
you are yes. talking of regeneration yes sir so, 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 sorry to interrupt yes, okay okay <coughs> So actually, I think this is a discussion you can oh, take tea. after this thing. Yeah, okay. tea. So because these people are waiting and they are short of time. Sorry. Sir, I just want to add, uh, I just want to uh, get some information from you. Is there any connection between Namibia, India, ivory trade and CITES role? Because we signed a uh, agreement with the Namibia and uh, I read in some newspapers that India is going to back Namibia in ivory, opening the ivory trade of Namibia into the world. Skip that meeting, I think. So this um, question refers to the fact that India has been against opening the trade for ivory. The multilateral environmental agreement that governs trade in wildlife products is called CITES. And the Conference of Parties of CITES, after we signed the MOU, met in December last year in Chile. And India, for the first time, abstained from voting. Yeah. It did not vote in support, but it abstained from voting. Now, whether 1 plus 1 is equal to 2 or 20 is up for you to determine. But the sequence of events is... We signed the MOU in August of 22. The cheetahs came in September of 22. The COP was held in December of 22, where we abstained. Those are statements of facts. What connects what? Bhagwan Jan. Assume. <laughs> yeah. I also heard that uh, Namibia is a thing of ivory, but I also heard that the elephants who have died, they take off their. Uh, like teeth and then make jewelry out of them. So I don't think there is an issue after uh, like uh, There is an that. issue because how do you know whether the elephant actually died or the elephant was killed? The ivory doesn't tell you that. Yes, sir. The so so the whole idea is if you allow trade, there will be demand. If there is demand, there will be illegal poaching. Mm -hmm. yes, sir. And fortunately, in also India also, because you cannot distinguish Asia, Africa African or Asia. That's why India has also banned uh, elephant capture. So I think, uh, is there any other? Uh, please. Sir, just one more, uh, one more uh, query from my side. Uh, do we, because I read in some newspapers, and uh, this thing, I think in JBNS's uh, Raja from Asob University wrote a very detailed paper. Do we have a wild population of cheetah in India? Yes, absolutely. Uh, that's the map I showed you. Okay. There is no way that a domestic uh, population of cheetahs, because cheetahs breed very badly in captivity, could have covered from Punjab to my native district, Tirunal Valley in southern uh, India, from Gujarat all the way to Bengal. And there's no reason to believe that if you can have cheetahs in Iran, you can't have cheetahs in India. I mean, cheetahs, lions, all evolved in the Ethiopian realm and through a process of national dispersal came through all the way to India. Of course, there is this whole theory, largely by Valmik Tapar, uh, saying these cheetahs were brought uh, from Africa by human agency. Some cheetahs were brought, but they were brought for private ownership by Maharajas, not to be released in the wild. And uh, just last little guy, uh, subspecies of Asiatic cheetah and subspecies, subspecies of African cheetah, how far they in the past? Uh, I don't know the exact African. numbers. The closest subspecies in Africa is the one found in Northern Africa. The Southern African subspecies which they brought to India is the most distant genetically. If you are asking how many years ago they uh, separated, I don't. Those numbers are not in my head right now. So are we are we uh, are we not doing this reverse evolution or the kind of reverse speciation of the species? Because in all assumed, we can assume that cheetah will survive in India. Now we are uh, introducing a foreign uh, gene pool or a foreign species or subspecies into <coughs> India, which is which was not a uh, home range or. In the past, even in the past, and as per the IUCN reintroduction guideline, you can't reintroduce anything in anywhere. With the exception that if it's an ecological substitute, today, given the low population in Iran, it is not correct to remove more animals from Iran. So the question really to ask is, why is India bringing cheetahs? Not whether southern African cheetahs are the best placed. 
assuming god forbid if the renin cheetah population goes extinct then you don't have a choice you have to get it from uh, africa so to me at this point of time the source of our cheetahs is not so much a problem the bigger problem is what are you going to do with it where is the space for it so sir uh, <coughs> one more <laughs> actually yes one last question and after that you have to definitely i don't want to yeah so uh, i was in the kumbh national park in 2022 when i saw how the safaris had already commenced and the district economy was already heavily dependent on tourism even in the absence of tigers which the government plans to bring soon so my question to you sir is uh, how is focusing primarily on the economic aspects of wildlife centuries wrong when a sikkim happens when a himachal happens where is your economy how do you account for those you externalize it you're only looking at the profits no the costs are never accounted for that's poor accounting what is economy if you're only counting it in terms of currency that's a very wrong way of doing it. people's lives matter if you breathing the air in delhi there's an economic cost to it is that accounted in your budgets and as long as you don't do that you will always show destroying nature is profitable think about it yeah so i have just one follow up question maybe a stupid question you know go to the big dog yeah so i i take the liberty to ask the question <laughs> so uh, <coughs> Uh, people often give the example of African model of conservation, and they say that you know because there are private reserves, there are game reserves, hunting is allowed some certain species, and there are advocates in uh, India also who believe that we should also open up our reserves to commercialization, like you know private interest to manage it, and we should open up hunting. Ayushin has been long advocating for hunting, uh, so it's not wrong to say that Ayushin is against hunting. So, what is your view as a conservation working in India? Because see, conservation is also very cultural, and our things are very different than Africa. So, just to throw a contrast, like very briefly, if you want to. No, on hunting or on on commercializing of the no. forest and of uh, habitats, and also hunting. See, it's unfair to use the term African model. Africa is a continent. That model is the South African, Namibian, probably Botswana yeah. model. countries like kenya and tanzania are very very different they have also succeeded in conservation they also hold a lot of wildlife populations i am not against people earning a good stable livelihood but who are these people in the name of wildlife conservation we say tribals are threats to wildlife and throw them out then you build five star resorts which have a huge carbon footprint including a swimming pool right and bring people in kiska livelihood ki baat kar rahe ho what are you commercializing you are commercializing the suffering of local people i am not against tourism why can't we build tourism models which make these people the primary stakeholders बिग मनी के साथ ही अगर काम करेंगे तो इट्स अ प्रॉब्लम डेफिनेटली आई थिंक दिस इज व्हाट आई थिंक ही वाज आल्सो ट्राइंग टू आस्क सो यू नो ही वाज आल्सो आस्किंग ही इज द मॉडरेटर सो आई हैव टू अलाउ हिम आई जस्ट वांटेड टू आस्क अ फॉलोअप क्वेश्चन दैट द वाइल्ड लाइफ प्रोटेक्शन एक्ट आर्ग्युएबली एस्टैब्लिशेस अ फॉरेस्ट कंजर्वेशन मॉडल डू यू थिंक दैट इज एन एक्सक्लूजनरी मॉडल it is obviously an exclusionary model the act says it but in practice it's a different matter try keep people out i mean india that's the magic of its democracy at the local level i mean there's only so much you can push back against local people i mean kaziranga yes they push back quite a bit there have been deaths and so on and so forth but you can't do that to every part and people also realize that you can't go destroy people i mean Today India has I forget the number some thousands of what are called community conserved areas these are not legal entities these are sacred groves and others uh, it could be wetland it could be any form of habitat which people protect of their own free will there are traditions associated with there are culture also there is often religion associated with it and India could not have succeeded in conservation 
if it is only a top down model. 50% of many of our endangered species are not within protected areas. Be it lions, tigers, leopards, snow leopards, rhinos, I mean, they are all over the place. Our parks are too small. Our parks are disconnected. Why would somebody tolerate elephants in his farm, tell me? Or leopard in his backyard? That tolerance is something we need to cultivate, respect, invest in and build upon. Rather than say, this is wildlife, this is people. Yeah. And actually, there was uh, last minute only one PCF was there and he <coughs> said that, you know, most of protected areas are protected areas in term. But actually, when you go there, so except few iconic reserves, you find people everywhere and you know, it is part of the landscape. So, I think this is a, a, a different political discussion. Uh, we should not go there. Uh, so, thank you very much, sir, for uh, spending time with us and to you, everyone, for coming uh, here and having this very intense and <coughs> Like you know, good discussion. I hope you also enjoyed the questions. And uh, now uh, I will uh, invite Shikha to for vote of thanks. Thank you, first of all, Dr. Chetan, for such an insightful conversation. I'm sure all the perspectives that you've given us will make us all look at the project and associated things in from a different perspective. And I would like to thank Dr. Rupa Mathav and Dr. Bharti Kumar and the members of the Collective of Environmental Action at NLU Delhi for supporting us with the event. Uh, I hope we can collaborate in the future as well and make them as successful as this one. And most importantly, I would like to thank our dear audience for being such patient listeners and for such interesting conversations. And Thank you all for coming and we have child in Samosa Southside. Wow. <laughs> <laughs>